Hello everyone and welcome back to our second lecture of our Bite Size Animal Law series. This is an eight-part series. Um, it will span the next six evenings, sorry, six Wednesdays at 7 p.m. And for those of you who attended last week, you'll know this is a basic introduction to animal law. The series is not um, connected lectures, so should you miss one, you will not be disadvantaged to then just catch up with the next one. And once the series is over, we will be posting to our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to rewatch one or catch up on one that you've missed, you'll be able to do so. Tonight, I am so thrilled to be able to introduce Dr. Joe Wills to you all. Joe is somebody that I worked closely with while setting up an animal society at Leicester Uni, and um, he was also my lecturer. So Joe, I'm, th I'm thrilled to be able to um, work with you this evening on this lecture. And Joe will be presenting Legal Personhood for Animals this evening. Um, so for those of you who don't know about Joe's work, Joe is a, of course, lecturer at Leicester University, and his interests are in human rights, animal rights, and moral and political theory. And he recently was awarded a Liver Hume Research Fellowship to produce a monograph on the moral and legal status of animals in Britain. So congratulations, Joe. Um, Joe is going to get started this evening by giving us a brief story about Cecilia the Chimp um, before he gets into his presentation about um, legal personhood for animals. So again, Joe, thank you so, so much for being with, being with us this evening. Um, we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Age. Um, and this cage could get as hot as 40 degrees in the summer and as cold as zero degrees in the winters. Originally, Cecilia shares this cage with two cage mates called Charlie and Zanzu, uh, but they, both, they died in 2014 and 2015, leaving Cecilia all alone. Um, and her physical and mental health really took a turn for the worse at this point. Uh, chimpanzees are like humans, they're highly social animals and like us they uh, can only really thrive in community with others. Um, and Cecilia becomes depressed and um, uh, you know much like we're hearing about stories of loneliness and isolation and anxiety in lockdown this is the same for chimpanzees, except they don't have video conferencing technology. Um, so she really was all alone and people really feared for her life. And so an animal rights organization in Argentina filed a lawsuit on behalf. And in this lawsuit, they argue that Cecilia is a person who's being unlawfully detained by the zoo. And they argued that she should be released and sent to a chimpanzee sanctuary. Uh, and this uh, was heard by a court in Argentina and the judge actually agreed with them. And the judge ruled that Cecilia is a legal person, um, that uh, a legal, a non-human legal person uh, who, uh, is, uh, whose liberty was being violated and uh, issued a writ calling for Cecilia to be released and transferred to a chimpanzee sanctuary in Brazil, which she was in April of 2017. And this is a picture of Cecilia in the, um, in, in, in the sanctuary in Brazil. And this is a, a poster that they made comparing Cecilia um, uh, after and before she was recognized as a legal person. And they report that Cecilia is doing great now. When she initially came to the sanctuary, she was shy and a bit scared of the other chimps, but now she's uh, mixing in really well and she's formed a very close relationship with a male chimpanzee called Marcelino. Um, and I've got a few pictures of them uh, goofing around here, uh, mm -hmm. getting intimate and showing each other affection. Um, and so Cecilia's uh, thriving now. She's living in community with other chimpanzees and able to exercise all the sorts of natural behaviors that she wasn't able to in captivity. Um, and I really just wanted to start with the story because when we talk about things like personhood for animals and legal rights, and sometimes it can sound a bit dry and abstract and 
uh, and so on. Um, but this really is about the individual lives of animals, their ability to flourish, and most importantly, how we choose to interact with them through the law as human beings. So I just want to flag that up and, you know, this is, this is a, a important issues we're going to be discussing today. And thank you so much, Joe. Yes, thank you for flagging up the title. We had a few technical issues, which put me a little off track, and I have forgotten to tell you guys the title of tonight's lecture. So it is Legal Personhood for Animals. Um, so as Joe has said, I have several questions to ask him, which will kind of talk us through this sorry, walk us through this topic of legal personhood for animals. So Joe, the first question I have for you is, what does legal personhood mean? So starting with a definition of legal personhood, it's a good, a good starting off point, but unfortunately it's a bit tricky because uh, uh, we don't really have a definitive uh, legal account of what a person is. So in the UK, for example, we don't have a single court judgment or piece of legislation that defines personhood or what a legal person is. And so in order to get to grips with this, we have to turn to legal theory, right? And this itself is problematic because legal theorists are in disagreement about who a person is. But it's quite a common view, uh, uh, quite a common view amongst uh, legal theorists, probably the prevailing and orthodox account of personhood is that in order to be a person in law, um, uh, a, a being or an entity has to be recognized as one who possesses legal rights or duties, or at least has the capability of possessing legal rights or duties. Now this raises another question, what do we mean by legal rights? Right? So it's generally regarded that if you have legal rights, that's sufficient to show that you're a legal person. Again, there's disagreement about what a legal right is, but for the sake of this conversation, I think we can think of a legal right um, or the relevant type of legal right uh, we're discussing here to be a sort of legally protected interest that can be enforced by a court of law. And in particular, a court of law has an ability to issue um, to issue a, uh, a, a, some sort of remedy or, um, or, or form of legal relief in the, uh, in the event uh, that a breach or a violation of their rights is found. And so I think this is what makes the Cecilia case a legal personhood case, right? Um, a, a lawsuit was brought um, on her behalf because of purported violations of her rights. Um, a court considered whether her rights were violated. They found that they were, and they issued a legal remedy in the form of uh, an order that she be released and relocated to a sanctuary for chimpanzees. So I think, uh, to, put, to put it uh, short, um, a legal person is a being that the, the law recognizes as possessing legal rights or duties that can be enforced in the courts. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Many people might intuitively think that human and person mean the same thing. Is that, sorry, mean the same thing in law. Is that right? Uh, so it's perfectly understandable that people would think this. Um, after all, in our everyday language, we often use the terms person and human synonymously. Um, so uh, an example I give my students when I teach this, I say in my building, there's an elevator and outside my elevator, it says maximum eight persons in the lift, right? And what persons means there is humans, of course. Um, but students who have studied law will know that often in the law, the law uses words that have, have one meaning in common, everyday language, but a, a specific technical meaning in the legal sphere. And that's very much the case with person. Human and person are distinct ideas in the law. And in fact, if you look throughout legal history, what you see is that a great many human beings haven't been recognized as persons in the past in various contexts and for various reasons. Now, the most obvious example of that would be enslaved human beings who are regarded as property, not as persons. Um, but other examples include women, children, colonized populations, people with mental health problems and mental disabilities. Um, at various points in time haven't been recognized as persons in the law. Now, thankfully today, we have international human rights law 
and international human rights law recognizes a fundamental right that every human being be recognized as a person before law. But even today, there are still some humans that aren't recognized as, uh, as persons. So for example, unborn humans, um, so fetuses, embryos, and zygotes are not recognized in most Western jurisdictions as persons. So both historically and in the contemporary period, uh, not human and person have distinct meanings in the law, although they're closely connected. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. Can individuals other than humans be persons in law? Uh, yes, they can. So um, not only is it the case that um, being a human isn't sufficient to be a person in law, it's also not necessary. Over the last couple of centuries, um, uh, the common law world has recognized a variety of non-human persons. So the most famous example of this is the corporation. Right? As students of company law will know, uh, uh, students of company law will know um, uh, 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 incorporated uh, companies have a separate and distinct legal personality from their shareholders and directors, right? So this means that a corporation can own property, enter into contracts, sue and be sued. And there's lots of examples like this. Under international law, national states have legal personality. In the Indian subcontinent, including during the British colonial era, a whole array of religious items have been recognized as persons, including idols and, and holy scriptures and sacred buildings. And in New Zealand in recent years, we've also seen a number of natural entities and ecosystems recognized as persons through treaties. So uh, rivers and mountains and national parks have been afforded personhood in New Zealand as well as in other countries. Um, so, uh, and of course, um, some courts are starting in, in certain jurisdictions now are also starting to recognize the personhood of non-human animals as well, such as in the Celia case, right? So personhood in the legal context really is a flexible device that's designed to sort of distribute rights and duties and responsibilities. It's, uh, as Stephen Wise of the Non-Human Rights Project would say, um, a personhood is not a matter of biology, it's determined by principle and policy. Thank you, Joe. Okay, what are the potential benefits of getting animals recognized as legal persons? Uh, so I think there are a number of benefits uh, for getting animals recognized as persons. One of them is sort of conceptual in that uh, it allows um, a shift in the status of animals in law from objects over whom rights and duties are exercised to becoming subjects who have rights of their own. Um, and, and I, I think this, this sort of shift in focus is, is made apparent when we um, compare the Cecilia case we started out with, with a standard animal welfare case. So animal welfare cases um, are, are criminal law cases. And what they center around is the defendant. Right? Did the defendant commit a certain form of conduct involving animals? Did they have the requisite mental state and so on? The animal is really part of the background of these cases. In the Cecilia case, by contrast, she's front and center, right? The, all the issues that are most pertinent in the case are things like, um, have Cecilia's rights been violated? What conditions is Cecilia living in? What legal remedies are available for Cecilia? And I think this perspective shift from object to subject uh, is really important against the backdrop of the property status of animals and the, and the various discourses and practices that treat animals as uh, expendable commodities that derive their value um, from their instrumental worth to humans rather than focusing on the intrinsic value and worth of the animals themselves. So that's the sort of, um, that, that's, that's the sort of conceptual benefit. I also think there are a few practical ones I'll mention briefly as well. So one practical benefit of, uh, of, animal, uh, of, of getting animals recognized as persons is it could potentially lead to stronger forms of protection for animals. As students who have studied animal uh, uh, law will know the sort of protections that are currently offered to animals are 
very weak, right, to say the least, if we can even call them protections. Um, and th there's only really one data point we need to see this, that's that factory farming exists and factory farming is legal. Um, but if we start to get animals recognized as personhood in certain contexts, then um, uh, types of protections that are currently available only to humans can be extended to animals too, right? So if um, humans have a right not to be um, detained unlawfully um, and uh, animals are recognized as persons with the same right, then we see an increase in parity between humans and animals as well as more robust forms of protection for the animal, right? So it sort of challenges the sort of ingrained speciesism uh, of, the, of our legal systems. Um, and finally, very briefly, um, there's the issue of remedies. So in animal welfare cases, uh, these normally result in some sort of punishment for the defendant if they're found guilty. So a custodial sentence or fine. There might be some indirect benefits to animals. They can also issue, you know, confiscation orders and stuff like that. But in personhood cases, you can get really tailored remedies potentially, right? And like in the Cecilia case, right? uh, a remedy that allowed her to live the rest of her life in in sort of peace and dignity. So I think those are just some of the potential benefits of, of personhood strategies. Thank you so much, Joe. What are some of the arguments that have been given against recognizing animals as legal persons? Yeah, so as you can imagine, um, there's been significant pushback against animal personhood in some of the countries where litigation's begun. Um, so one objection says that personhood in the law is really uh, a device for advancing human interests. Right? And so even if it's the case that a, a number of non-human entities have been given personhood, such as, such as uh, rivers and temples and corporations, the reason these people argue that they have been afforded personhood is because doing so serves human interests, right? Humans have interests in entering into business arrangements, they have interests in religious worship, and they have uh, interests in enjoying the natural environment. By contrast, if we extend personhood to animals, that's focused on animal interests, but personhood is really all about human interests. Uh, so I think there are a number of problems with this objection. Um, one of them is that I think it actually mischaracterizes some of the extensions of personhood we've seen um, in particularly countries like India and New Zealand, where personhood has been extended to religious and natural objects. Um, the reason, or at least a large part of the reason why there's been this extension is because many people in those countries view these natural and religious items as sacred, as having intrinsic worth and value. So the extension of personhood hasn't been wholly anthropocentric in these jurisdictions. Um, but more importantly, I think this sort of objection just begs the question, let's just grant for the sake of arguments that, that, um, that personhood currently exists only to serve human interests. Right? That's not an argument against the law evolving and developing and changing to incorporate the interests of other beings as well. But after all, at one point, uh, um, uh, per the, 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 uh, the category of legal personhood didn't recognize uh, enslaved human beings as, in, as, in, as within the circle of legal protection and legal personhood, right? But if we look back in retrospect, we, we wouldn't think that that's a good argument for not abol abol you know, um, getting rid of slavery and extending personhood out. And so we might ask, well, why not continue expanding the circle of protection? It's not as if we're certain that we've got the boundaries right now. So I, I think it's just a sort of fallacious and sort of conservative argument. Uh, I'll mention a, a few others briefly. Um, so one argument about why animals can't be persons is, Animals can't give instructions, they can't initiate claims, um, they, 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 they lack the capacity to enforce or waiver rights they have and so forth. Um, that was an argument made in 2015 in an, in an English court where a woman filed a civil suit on behalf of herself, her two children and her two dogs. And the, the claim on behalf of the two dogs was struck down by the High Court judge uh, on the basis that he said, look, these dogs you know, can't instruct um, uh, solicitors on how to uh, pursue the claim and so forth. Um, and one other related objection, um, a similar 
objection to that is, and this is one that's come up a lot in the US in, in animal personhood cases there. Courts say animals can't be legal persons because they can't bear legal duties. Um, and this is a sort of social contractarian view that says in order to, um, to be a legal person and to have legal rights, this comes with responsibilities and duties. And because animals can't be held accountable in the law, uh, neither should they be given personhood or fundamental human-like rights. Okay, now both of these um, arguments are, are also flawed, I think, and they're both flawed for the same reason, and that's that they don't reflect current legal practice or understanding of personhood at all, right? Because uh, there are all sorts of human beings who can't initiate lawsuits and can't bear societal duties or, or, legal, ob or legal obligations, right? So very young children, for example, or adults of various kinds who lack legal capacity, yet, uh, as far as I'm aware, there's no jurisdiction that denies their persons. So I think these sort of arguments, again, just fall back on a speciesist logic that, that, don't, that, 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 that doesn't really have any sort of objective basis for distinguishing uh, humans from animals when it comes to a potential personhood. Right? So in sum, I, I, think, I don't think there, has, there have as of yet been any sort of knockdown arguments that show that animal legal personhood is either um, uh, a logical impossibility or a conceptual impossibility. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. And can you just chat to us very briefly about what sort of legal strategies have been used so far to get legal personhood of animals recognized? Mm -hmm. um, Yes, so I mean, uh, there have been uh, strategies and lawsuits and uh, lobbying efforts um, and referenda in a variety of different jurisdictions. Um, we've seen uh, campaigns in Argentina, in Colombia, in the United States, um, in, in India, in, uh, there, there, I think there's current initiatives going on in both Finland and uh, Switzerland as well that are, that are personhood-like in nature. Um, I think probably the most significant one, and I'll just mention this briefly, is, is the, because uh, uh, I presume most of the people logging in are, are from the UK, um, and so in the United States there's the Non-Human Rights Project, and they've been um, uh, 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 launching a series of, 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 of personhood cases based around a writ of habeas corpus, which is essentially a legal mechanism for challenging unlawful detention. This was the strategy that was used in the Cecilia case as well. And this is actually inherited from English common law. And um, so if I can just very briefly state the Non-Human Rights Project's basic um, sort of uh, litigation argument, and that's that um, uh, the writ of habeas corpus is designed to protect liberty. Um, and uh, so it applies to autonomous beings. Um, but humans, they say, are not the only autonomous beings in the world. Um, studies in cognitive ethology show that a, 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 a certain non-human animals also possess very human-like capacities. Um, for example, the great apes, elephants, dolphins and whales. And they're litigating on behalf of these non-human animals saying that they have liberty interests protected by the writ of habeas corpus. Um, and so far they've uh, initiated five habeas corpus um, suits on behalf of four chimpanzees and four elephants in the states of New York and Connecticut. Um, as of yet, the, uh, they haven't uh, won uh, a habeas corpus writ on behalf of any of their clients, but they, they've definitely shifted the needle. There's been some interesting persuasive precedents, um, so, some very sympathetic judgments, and within both uh, sort of judicial culture and the legal academy, uh, there's been a noticeable shift and a, a greater openness to the idea of uh, animal legal personhood. So I think they've made significant strides. And, and, and just one more thing to add, um, pretty much every argument that applies in the US context also in theory also applies in the UK context, um, which I think is something interesting to bear in mind. Excellent. Thank you, Joe, so, so much. That was really, really quite interesting. Um, so we do have lots of questions. I believe you can see them as well, can't you? Uh, I can. 
Okay, so I shall ask you some. Okay, um, have any animals in the UK ever been given legal personhood? Uh, no, they haven't. Um, in fact, there have there have been no uh, litigation attempts so far, even uh, trying. Um, there are, I, I won't say much about this, but there are current discussions going on amongst certain animal lawyers exploring, exploring this possibility. Uh, so watch this space. Um, the nearest we've got was this case I mentioned from 2015 called Moosh. It's called Mooshin and Others, if anyone's interested in it. And uh, to be frank, it was quite possibly the worst possible case to ever trial a sort of question of whether animals can be persons. Um, the, the, the woman who brought the claim, it was a, everything about the lawsuit was a catastrophe, really. It was a, it, 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 it was a mortgage dispute with HSBC. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's really unfortunate that that was the first test case for animal personhood. But the, the, the arguments uh, 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 and the, uh, the nature of the litigation were, were so weak uh, uh, and, and, and the animal question was, was sort of peripheral to it. And I think the courts were getting quite fed up with this litigant for uh, filing lots of sort of um, uh, frivolous lawsuits. <laughs> so uh, short answer, no, no animals have been given personhood, but there's been no real attempt to do so yet. Excellent. Okay, you answered the second part of the question. Um, okay, do you foresee any opportunities to bring personhood type case? Oh, so you've kind of already answered that. I guess you've mentioned that there are some cases in the works. Yeah, and, and, and maybe one, one other thing I, I could mention um, in, in relation to that. Uh, in th th there's a town in the southwest of, of England called Froome and uh, fr recently they elected a bunch of independent councillors who are really keen on the environment and what they're currently trying to do is draft a bylaw to get the river Froome recognized as a legal person um, and they're working with an environmental organization uh, to get this bylaw drafted, or it has to be approved by central government. There'll be all sorts of barriers. I'm not sure how likely it will be in succeeding, but it is interesting that we're already looking at, uh, at some some personhood strategies in in the field are already underway, and it'll be quite interesting to see how that develops. Thank you, Joe. Um, okay, do courts find it more convincing that an animal possesses legal personhood if they share more human traits, like a chimpanzee, for example, whether this be biological, social, skill, capabilities, etc.? Yes, yeah, so I think that's the thinking behind, for example, the non-human rights projects focus on animals who have certain human-like capacities, um, and particularly um, it's this idea that uh, they have liberty interests that are similar to humans. That, that's what makes the, the writ of habeas corp corpus plausible. Um, in other jurisdictions, that there, there, have been, um, there have been other types of animals which people have argued uh, for personhood on behalf of. So in Colombia, for example, that there, there was a case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Colombia, uh, arguing that uh, an Andean bear should, should be uh, granted a writ of habeas corpus. Um, and that was very much more connected, I think, to endangered species and wildlife conservation. In Argentina at the moment, um, a, a lawsuit has recently begun um, to try and get endangered jaguars recognized as legal persons. Um, so I think the question of, 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 of which animals courts are going to find more likely to be granted, uh, to grant personhood, is going to depend on the, the, the judicial culture of the country in question. Um, I think the non-human rights project work on the assumption that in America, liberty and autonomy are really significant sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, political, social and cultural norms, and therefore arguing uh, for personhood on behalf of of autonomous beings um, it is thought to be uh, a, a, a maybe a, a, a more winning strategy. Right, okay, thank you. Um, okay, this says, is there any way to see the previous lectures? So yes, we actually do um, intend to post the series to YouTube once we've completed the series. So um, if all goes well, it should all be there on our YouTube channel once it's over. So you will be able to view ones that you have missed. 
Um, okay. How do you think animal law practitioners, <clears throat> such as ELDF, advocates for animals, animal justice, or other lawyers working in this area can complement the work towards personhood? Uh, sorry, so the question is how can uh, lawyers working in this area contribute towards personhood? Yeah, yeah, how can they complement the work towards personhood? So they just mentioned ALDF, advocates for animals, animal justice, or other lawyers. How can they complement the work? Well, um, I, I, I suppose that the, the, the role that lawyers play is, is, you know, is getting the legal arguments right. Um, I, I think personhood strategies um, actually have to go much beyond the law. Um, so the Non-Human Rights Project, for example, uh, have, have worked with both philosophers and cognitive ethologists in, in producing affidavits and um, uh, or, or rather um, uh, amicus briefs. Um, I, I, and I think similarly, uh, you know, for any country to be able to successfully win personhood, it's going to involve a coalition of, of lawyers and scientists and, and philosophers and ethicists, um, because this is really a new and emerging area of law. But I certainly think, um, you know, lawyers like, uh, you know, and, and, and just uh, you mentioned the ALDF, they, they are also pursuing uh, not, they're not quite using, I don't think, the, the language of personhood, but they're currently pursuing a personhood-like case on behalf of a, a horse called Justice at the moment, arguing that this horse should be able to sue under tort law for damages. Um, uh, and so there's lots of really creative and interesting um, legal strategies being engaged at the moment. Um, and I also mentioned some really interesting initiatives in, in Switzerland and, and Finland as well. Um, so I think it's just a matter of um, uh, uh, lawyers looking at the jurisdiction they're based in and trying to work out, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, the path of least resistance towards shifting the needle when it comes to animal personhood. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. Okay. What practical benefits does legal personhood bring the animal that ensuring their welfare does not? So I guess what is the advantages of legal personhood over just ensuring their welfare? Yeah, so I, I, we, we discussed this earlier. Um, the, 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 it's not really an issue. I, I don't think that the trade-off is really recognizing their personhood or recognizing their welfare. It's more um, uh, getting their personhood recognized and the possibilities that opens up versus trying to get them protected under our existing animal welfare legislation, right? And the problem uh, with our existing animal welfare legislation, um, and, 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 and just to make clear, I'm not against um, animal welfare uh, um, campaigning, by the way. I, I've got a blog on Advocates for Animals where I, I argue that personhood strategies and welfare strategies are complementary rather than, rather than in opposition. But at the same time, there are some limits to, to the welfare strategy and that, you know, the, the sort of standards, uh, unnecessary suffering always involves a, a balancing act between human interest and animal interest and standardly the human interests tend to win. Um, in most countries, you know, farming practices and slaughter and scientific experiment of scientific experiments are, are broadly um, hived off and, and, and welfare cases tend to revolve around sort of cruelty to cats and dogs and horses and sometimes farm animals as well. But um, uh, I, 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 the, the benefits I mentioned include, you know, sort of tailored legal remedies, um, legal protections more akin to human protections, um, and, uh, and, and, and a sort of conceptual shift to viewing animals as, uh, as objects, to viewing animals as subjects, making animals the focal point of, of legal uh, cases of litigation. Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, this question says, where should we draw the line? Um, or, you know, where would you draw the line? At cetaceans, um, cephalopods? So it, when we ask where do we draw the line, it depends what type of line we're talking about. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, there's a sort of moral question of which animals deserve to have fundamental rights and legal personhood. Um, and personally speaking, I draw the line, broadly speaking, at sentient beings. I think it's the capacity to feel 
uh, pleasure and pain and to be able to flourish or suffer um, uh, uh, that, 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 that's, the, that's the dividing line between beings that have inherent value and beings that, that don't. I mean, I'm actually open to non-sentient creatures having types of value as well, actually, because I certainly think sentience is sufficient. But if we, if uh, there's a problem with making sentience the basis of, of, of legal personhood strategies in that it's hard to imagine them being successful. Um, or at least say in the UK context, right? Because if, if we say all sentient beings of personhood, does that mean that the, the, uh, the one million chickens that we raise in the UK every year um, have to be liberated from all the factory farms? I mean, ethically, yes, they should, but can we ever imagine a court granting that, right? And so, so when we're thinking about drawing the line, um, we have to think strategically about what's possible. Um, and, I, I th and this is where, where I think animal welfare strategies are useful, right? Because animal welfare strategies can apply very broadly um, to all, you know, the legislation already recognizes all sentient beings as, as being protected. Right? So the way I like to think of it is welfare strategies are sort of a wide um, but shallow, whereas personhood strategies are narrow and deep. And I think, uh, I think that any successful uh, sort of strategy for improving the legal status of animals should involve both of those things. Um, and we shouldn't be um, uh, going after other animal advocates because they're doing something different. We should embrace as many different uh, approaches that we can. Um, so so, so I, I'm up for a real plurality of legal strategies and I just see uh, personhood strategies as one in a portfolio of many different options. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Okay, I'll just um, get a few more questions. Um, okay, I wonder if we could incorporate a company, maybe C, maybe a CIC, um, which was a service company for a particular animal. The company's legal personhood might then give the animal some sort of quasi standing, um, especially if the articles of the company stated the company's purpose was the promotion of that animal's welfare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. I mean, uh, as far as I'm aware, the 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 the, um, the the company, of course, already would be a legal person. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll have to mull over that. That that sounds really interesting. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, I guess you've kind of touched on this, Joe. But if you want to add further, um, what do you think should be the baseline for personhood, sentience, or the practical autonomy? Yeah, so it, it, it'd be the same as last, morally, um, and in an ideal world, I'd say it should be sentient. Um, I, I can't imagine um, all sentient beings being recognized as persons in the, in the near future, to say the least. I, I think getting any animals recognized as persons is a phenomenally difficult uphill battle. Um, so, I, I mean, uh, but I wouldn't be prescriptive in saying it, it, the basis should be practical autonomy, because I think maybe that's an appropriate strategy to pursue in the US context, um, particularly if you're dealing with a writ of habeas corpus. But, you know, in other countries, um, you know, uh, focus on the fact that it's an endangered species. Uh, you know, if that's going to work, you give that a go. Um, in India, we've had two courts actually declare that the entire animal kingdom are legal persons. Um, but uh, I, I, unfortunately, I, I read that those statements as sort of legal rhetoric in the sense that, uh, as far as I could tell, what the judges meant in those two cases is that, is that all these animals are protected by existing welfare law and the recognition of personhood didn't really add anything on top of that. But you know, uh, I could imagine, for example, in India, you know, it, maybe it would be quite easy to get a cow recognized as a legal person, right? Cows are protected under the Indian constitution. Uh, they're regarded as, as sacred by many Hindus. Um, you know, that's so that there's, that, that it, it's going to depend on the, on the legal culture, I think. It's a, it's, a, it's a tactical question, not a principled one, as far as I see. Thank you, Joe. Um, how would you reconcile property rights in respect of animals with concepts of legal personhood? Are the two not mutually exclusive? Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, so certainly 
historically, they have been regarded as mutually exclusive. Um, and uh, at the very least, we can say there's a very strong tension between the idea of being owned as property and being a person. Because when we think about property, we think about instrumental value, and we think about the fact that others can, um, can uh, exert rights over you. Whereas when we think about persons, we think more about inherent value and possessing rights in and of yourself. Right? So there's a clear tension there. But there's been a lot of interesting legal and political scholarship recently that sort of said, well, may maybe there's this uh, tension, but there isn't anything conceptually incoherent about, about um, about um, being owned as property and being a person. After all, corporations are owned by their shareholders, but also recognized as legal persons. Um, so, uh, so uh, and, and as far as I'm aware, the non-human rights project in their cases are not, are not um, disputing the, the, the chimpanzees' property status. They're saying that they're persons. Um, and that hasn't, there's been various pushback and, and rejections from the courts and so on, but, but as far as I'm aware, none of them have been, they can't be persons because they're property. So uh, I do think the ideas are intention. I don't think that they're, they're sort of conceptually, impossibly uh, uh, incompatible with one another. Okay, excellent. Okay, I'm going to pick one more. Okay, um, to what extent is the concept of legal personhood for all non-human animals compatible with animal agriculture? Is veganism its natural conclusion? Is it compatible? Uh, I'd have to say no, and then I'd have to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I, I think I think if you recognize all sentient beings as persons, then you probably shouldn't eat them. Um, <laughs> what did you have to, What did you have for dinner today? A person it doesn't doesn't ring off the off the tongue so nicely. <laughs> no, definitely not. Excellent. Thank you so so much, Joe. And I'm so sorry to all the questions that we didn't get to answer. Um, I'm. Let me pop. Um, our student email into the chat and if anybody does want to send their questions along uh, there we go so it's obviously the student group email but feel free to send along any questions and I can filter them out to somebody who can help answer um, so Joe thank you so so much for being with us this evening um, this was so fascinating and um, we are looking so forward to next week as well. So after this evening's webinar, I will send along the event for next week's for you all to join up and attend. Um, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Gareth Spark, and he's going to discuss animal welfare, ethics, and sentience. So it'll be next Wednesday, the same time. Um, and I'll send along the link this evening for you all to sign up. So um, again, thank you, Joe, so, so much for being with us this evening. I, I'd just like to thank uh, you uh, and, and Aylor for putting this on and for all the participants for their really intelligent and thought-provoking questions. It's been great. Yes, there is quite a few. There's still 50 questions there that we didn't actually get to answer. So thank you all so much. It's been really engaging. It's been excellent. Um, and we hope to see you all next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>